If I could turn back time. <laughs> you started that like a complete... You sung two songs in a single line. You went, if I could turn back time. <laughs> that was, I mean, I think you're the first man to properly confuse the YouTube AI bots. You took two songs and went <laughs> splat. <laughs> Hello and welcome back and it's me and Eddie the web guy and once again we are talking about Plex media server on a network attached storage. Plex on an ads is like straightforward. However, despite the fact that we've been talking about this subject for more years than I care to remember, it's worth highlighting that we do generally, whether it's in the NAS compares for advice section, subtle plug, or it's just generally on the internet on Reddit and forums and stuff like that. People seem to make the same mistakes. And a lot of the time, people buy a network attached storage device for Plex and they don't realize, one, that they bought poorly early doors, or two, that they don't realize they could be having a better experience. So today, me and Eddie have put together the eight biggest mistakes that people seem to make when buying their first NAS for Plex Media Server. Some of this is NAS, some of it's Plex, some of it's both. But these are the eight mistakes that we keep seeing time and time again. Eddie, What's the first mistake? The first mistake would be choosing a right uh, CPU. Because um, that's right, when you're just uh, got into a NAS sort of industry, NAS like a uh, marketplace, you might think like um, all I need is like really good CPU because this is what you would do normally on your NUC PC because before you had NAS, you might have had um, a computer which you turned into a Plex server, but then oh, you realize that yeah. power supply and all these things and tickling and keeping it on and it's like it's just not worth it and also running out of space so you go in and out and then you think probably I need to match the same CPU uh, what I had on a uh, on a computer with a NAS which most of the cases is actually right it's true but the other thing is that most of the time on the desktop computers or laptops or whatever where you run your Plex you will find a CPU which has graphics embedded. Mm. So in that case, you don't need to um, worry much about um, the performance because this chip inside the CPU will take care of transcoding up to certain uh, tr a resolution. Obviously, when you go to 4K, then this chip is going to be simply too weak to, to convert this uh, video it's into tall, something smaller. So in that case, tall, yeah. it, it borrows some performance from overall a CPU performance and calculations. So if you got something like i7 with graphics chip, some anything up to 1080p, the little graphics chip will take uh, take care of it. So the uh, the performance of your NAS is not going to be impacted. So you can still use other apps and everything and everything's going to go smooth. But once you start transcoding 4K, it's just going to take all resources it can from mm -hmm. this uh, i7 to transcode this 4K and it's going to work. So the same the same things applies to NAS as well. Because in some cases, if you only need uh, 1080p uh, video transcoding, then um, all you need is really some cheap Celeron-based NAS, which has this embedded graphics in there. So it's going to deal with the graphics, and you're still going to have fast enough NAS to deal with other things like backups mm. and whatever you want it. And that's thanks to that embedded processor. And again, yeah. Time and time again, we see people buying like Xeon based NASs. Again, right here in the background, it's slightly out of shot. There's the DS1621XS Plus Xeon based NAS. Really, really good system. It performed very well in NAS, but proportionally, the percentage of CPU utilization was just insane compared with a bog standard Celeron. Again, once you reach 4K, slightly different because then the GPU just freaks out that embedded GPU and then the CPU's raw power it then steps in. Anyway, so the second mistake that we see a lot of people making when it comes to the first Plex Media Server NAS, it's the noise. So many of you, when you buy a network attached storage device, now, and I get it, uh, and NAS, not everyone's had one before, you stick it in the attic, you stick it in a cupboard, etc., etc. but too many of you have the NAS in an area that you're going to be in regularly, be it the same, you know, home cinema, flicking through the movies, oh, boom, Avengers. Or you are utilizing it in a home office, or one way or another, you've bought a NAS that primarily you're using for Flex Media Server, and it's in a location where you're going to be watching the media at the same time, or just generally very close to it. And the problem is, NASs can make ambient noise. The drives inside can make ambient noise. And I don't know if you guys have ever enjoyed watching TV when there's noise going on, it's not fun. It's not fun. And too many of you 
do not take into consideration the noise a NAS makes when utilizing it for Plex Media Server. Either chuck that somewhere real far away, not the sky, I'm talking the attic, a cupboard, something like that, and basically make sure it's not in immediate uh, your immediate um, range. But secondly, bear in mind about the noise these devices make. The manufacturers make a very, very good point of talking about ambient noise levels and hard drives once they hit that sacred 8 TB mark, so you've got 1, 2, 4, 6, 8 TB. After that, hard drives are generally more enterprise in architecture. And although you might think, I want to buy my first network attached drawer device for Plex, and I don't want to buy another one for the next five, six years, I'm going to slam some 18 TB drives in there. Good for you. They are going to make such a racket. Get them, but make sure that NAS is not in your local ambient environment. If you don't believe me, check out the videos from a couple of months ago where we did audio testing on just a single hard drive. It was like um, a, a jar of nails falling down the stairs. It was not a fun noise. Eddie, over to you. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to connect uh, through HDMI, because lots of people might want to, and you also want massive capacity, then you may actually consider getting really cheap secondary NAS, which you can keep away somewhere in a, in a cupboard. And then the NAS, which you connect through HDMI, just stick one SSD in there. It's quiet mm. because that main multimedia NAS can be then linked with your additional storage in a cupboard. You know, and that, mm. that, 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 that one can make noises. So yeah, so we can move on uh, about memory in the Plex NAS because um, people usually think like, how much memory do I need? Because with Plex, Plex is very resource demanding app. It's third party app, it's not like a built-in video station or DS video, what you would find on QNAP or Synology. Plex do need more RAM, so at least somewhere like one gigabyte, I would go for two even gigabytes. But also, a lot of people buy NAS with um, this one gigabit, uh, two gigabits minimum requirement, and then they end up actually realizing that there is not enough memory because they forgot about our system itself and other apps because it's not just Plex there. Other apps need as well uh, memory. If you, especially if you run things like virtual machines or a web server or something like that, all of these things need RAM. And also if you enable um, a caching, also need RAM. All these extra things need RAM. But um, if there's gonna be only Plex on the NAS, then um, most of the time with two gigabytes, there should be enough for system mm. uh, things to be run and, and the Plex as well. It's and other thing is other people as well with the RAM, actually they say, they ask, if I'm gonna add more RAM, like four gigabytes, six gigabytes, is my Plex gonna run faster? And the question answer is really, if you are running out of the memory, yes, it will improve the speed because when you run out of memory, the system is borrowing the storage space from the hard drive, which is so much slower than RAM. So in those cases, you need more RAM. But if you never hit the mm. maximum of your RAM, you're going to add more RAM. It's not going to change anything. I mean, again, the only thing I would add to that is when in doubt, four gig minimum. There's a reason a lot of these quad-core Celeron systems and particularly media systems have four gig minimum. Just go with that generally because the system be back unsafe. end and the live caching, absolutely. Reason number four, or I say reason number four, the fourth mistake we see lots of people making when purchasing a NAS for, uh, for Plex Media Server comes down to HEVC, Highly Efficient Video Codec or Compression, depending on where you read the acronym, otherwise known as um, H.265. It's been around for a number of years now, four or five years, and it is by far the more efficient compression technique of multimedia. So why am I bringing it up? What's the mistake? Nice and simple. Its predecessor, H.264, been around for a while, although not as compressed, has to be said, plays pretty much on everything. Whereas H.265, HEVC, uh, and generally in more modern times found in 10-bit HDR, the result um, with them on a lot of modern systems is they won't be played. Have you ever tried to play a modern file on a Windows PC and wh whatever window calls um, its video player these days goes, no, nah, I'm not having it. We need something more for this, you need a codec. That's because H.265 has a more complex royalty structure. H.264, I should say, only has the one patent pool. So that is a bunch of brands that you know, work together to produce an R&D this, and it's so straightforward, it's unreal. Uh, H.265 has, has three patent pools, and the royalty structure behind it is so much more complex. The result is that everything 
from Windows to Apple to Google to the NAS brands haven't got the licensing, haven't got the codec utilization permission. And the result is, because it does cost money to do that, the result is that if you try to play H.265 natively on an NAS, it will automatically uh, transcode. It will automatically have to change that file. It's not doing it because that file's too complex or doing it because of um, inconsistencies. It's doing it because it's forced to do so. The same files in H.264 and H.265, 10 bit or not, the latter requires changing it doesn't require much but it has a tremendous impact on the system watch a lot of my videos where i transcoded a lot of those jellyfish files and even though the size of 264 and 265 files of the same caliber and scale the result was the 265 had to be transcoded and the result was system resource utilization shot right up so find out what your library is find out what those files are because chances are you might be getting a NAS that in theory can play back all of those files but however when you play it you hit a wall instantaneously there are ways around it QNAP for example have um, a Cyan or Cayenne player which allows you to add codec support for H.265 on your NAS thereby getting around this but that is an additional monthly fee it's a payment structure which a number of you are thinking, no, 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 no. I've just bought a NAS, I'm not having that. Over to you, Eddie. Yeah, exactly. So you need to first figure out, is your TV compatible with this new way of compressing these video mm -hmm. files, which is 265? And um, if your TV doesn't support, you might be need to consider um, uh, USB, not HDMI dongle, like from Amazon or, or uh, Android, and that therefore you would have this compatibility with mm. these uh, kind of uh, codecs or other way obviously is connecting your NAS to your TV directly through HDMI so you don't need to convert things you just mm. play uh, directly the original file um, we can you? move on on yeah on about the Plex pass as well uh, lots of people think like do I actually need it or if I get it is it worth it and um, most of the time <laughs> um, you might not need it uh, if you just want to simply uh, play your videos. Mm -hmm. If you want uh, other extras like um, access to a hardware transcoding chip, then then um, Plex have made this a, as a demand, a requirement, Premium, so yeah. they could sell their passes. So if, if you want to take advantage of this um, transcoding chip, uh, then uh, then you need to pay for this pass. But so um, for the dashboard as well. Yeah, also dashboard, they will be not giving you full access like to see is how much CPU resources are taken for the transcoding and uh, uh, and things like that. In in normal case, if you don't have many users, really, you wouldn't care about these things, mm. but, um, but otherwise you do. Of, a lot of the stuff in Plex Media Server behind the Plex Pass, it's so ambiguous um, because a lot of people, when they use Plex, Plex has been free for most of the time they use it. It's like the people that don't pay for WinRAR, the people that don't pay for VLC or donate. I'm one of them. So a lot of people, when they do use Plex Media Server, they have already feel in the gall, the gall of having to buy a network attached storage device. And the idea that they've had to spend a few hundred nicker or a thousand in some cases, and then be told some of the features they expected to have are not available. There is an inconsistency between Plex clients and Plex media server for NAS compared with just using the Plex client. And all too often, you're not aware that some of the features are just not going to be available. There's lots of streaming type stuff on there that most people, let's be honest, largely ignore. But a lot of the resource gathering, a lot of the scraping of the metadata, some of the sources, some of the routines, and definitely, as Eddie mentioned there, the um, a lot of the back-end CPU, bandwidth utilization, network utilization, that analytical information is presented in a very Plex-specific way that you can't have without the Plex pass, which can annoy some people and ultimately lead a lot of people to be quite um, disappointed with uh, a Plex media server now. But number six, while I'm rabbiting at you and not letting Eddie get a word in edgeways, this one is something that Ed's actually alluded to a couple of times there. And this is to do with HDMI out on a NAS. 
because as Eddie rightly pointed out there, a lot of people, when they get a NAS, they're thinking about the 4K version of the final cut of Avatar where you can actually count the pixels. Um, but it's just madness. These um, They want to take advantage of a Plex NAS with an HDMI output, bung it into the big old TV, your OLED or something, and really enjoy that media with latency that's close to zero. However, what a lot of people aren't aware of is that in 2021, the state of HDMI out on a NAS with Plex is nowhere near as good as it used to be. Plex is no longer available for as an HDMI tool officially on a number of NAS brands out there, and you have to go for third-party tools um, and there's kind of homebrewy type versions which are updated um, but a lot of NAS brands with HDMI out no longer had a Plex media server app immediately available. This isn't their fault, this is Plex who have just thought no we're not going to chuck a load of R&D and a bit of budget into an HDMI GUI um, and therefore as these NAS have moved into newer versions of their software, QNAP example moving into HD Station um, version 4, a lot of those apps where they needed the uh, third party developer to kind of get on board and the third party developer went, yeah, we ain't got no money for that. Uh, they didn't develop an HDMI alternative. So the result was that right now, if you do buy an NAS, um, a, a, a QNAP or an Acer store with an HDMI out and you're hoping to enjoy Plex, you are not going to be utilizing proper um, Plex endorsed tools, nor are you going to be utilizing QNAP or Acer Store verified tools. You're going to be using slightly homebrew kind of rejigged ones, which again, I know a number of you are going to look at that interface and go, well, I'm not enjoying this at all. So do bear that in mind. If you are buying a Plex NAS uh, for HDMI out, double check the apps you're going to be utilizing because there's a good chance you are going to come away disappointed. Everybody yeah, know? and let's move to the next point about transcoding and do I really need it? Mm. Because big, lots of people think mistake, that yeah. transcoding equals streaming. That, that, that's the same word, but it's not. Transcoding, what it means is video conversion on the fly. So as, as the file is being pulled from the NAS, it sees the destination device will not be able to play this file. So in the middle, it needs mm. to change the format of the video so that destination device can actually play it. That's what transcoding is. Mm. But if you have up-to-date TV or, or a phone, very likely that you can stream original file on your destination device. The reason why you wouldn't be able to do that is that your TV is really old. Or if you stream on your phone locally, for example, that your, your um, network is so busy that you need to actually uh, squeeze that file smaller, just resize it so, so that there is enough bandwidth in the network to stream. And especially mm -hmm. that applies for remote streaming. When you're streaming through 3G and like 1080p or 4K, there is not enough bandwidth to actually play original file. Mm. Yes, the internet is getting faster, so there's 100, 200 megabit internet available so soon the transcoding will be less and less um, needed because you will be able to stream original files. But um, but that's, that's the thing you need to keep in mind. Transcoding doesn't mean streaming. So if, you have, if you're in at home, you've got the compatible TVs, compatible devices, you've got fast enough internet, uh, uh, I mean ethernet or uh, Wi-Fi, you, especially if you moved on to Wi-Fi 6 already, very likely that you won't need the transcoding, only really for remote transcoding or old devices. Mm. I think a lot of people, when they go into buying a NAS for Flex Media Server, they go in with a certain budget in their head. Again, we've talked about this before, 500, 1,000, 2,000, etc. And where that money goes, be it on the storage, the NAS or whatever, or the memory as we've discussed, a lot of people supersize the NAS or go for something high-end that then they know that they're never going to watch this media outside the house. There are only going to be just two, three TVs in the house. You know, there's a home console over there. They aren't, they're relying on a network, a 100 megabyte per second network, which is, if you've got devices, as you rightly point out, that can play these files, is more than sufficient. And the money that you may have binned on a NAS that was heavily GPU embedded, you're never going to use that. And therefore, that money could go into storage. It could go into another tiers of backup. It could go into so many other things. And all too often, we're seeing people buying some... Pentium i3 i5 solution for a setup 
where they could have got away with a Celeron or even in some cases that new Ryzen that has no GPU embed, uh, embedded uh, GPU on the CPU, but nevertheless outperforms on the local area network versus a number of higher end CPUs just within that context. So just know whether you're actually going to need to reformat those files. So our last point, and this is such a minor one, it's a very, very small point that a lot of people overlook. And most people find out about this during the setup. And even when they don't find out about this, when they find out about it later on, they are up till 2, 3 a.m. They're furious. They don't know what the problem is. And when they find out, they're, they're just livid. And that is that in a lot of senses, Plex Media Server is always online. Lots of people don't seem to realize that as much as I talk about network attached storage device and getting away from the cloud and stuff like that, Plex Media Server needs to bounce occasionally and just ping the main Plex server. You can't, if you try to set up a NAS using just the network, all too often you find out that you can't see the NAS. The NAS still needs to have even a limited internet accessibility. And with that, ping the Plex Media Server. If you don't have it, sometimes the Plex Media Server won't appear or it can fluctuate on your network and not appear on your client devices. And it's not something you can really pin down. It's not a consistent thread. It, it's not a case of if you disconnect the Plex Media Server from the internet but keep it on the network, it'll stop working immediately. But if it, that app isn't able to just ping Plex in some way periodically, and I can't even tell you what's in that, then you can hit um, uh, client and NAS communication problems. Have you noticed that before, Ed? Yeah, there's not just um, pinging. It's also you need to remember that all subtitles, uh, not even subtitles, that um, uh, icons and all these um, thumbnails, Scraping, all yeah. of this need to be synchronized all the time to the servers. Mm. And um, and that, that's true. It's always pinging back as well because you, you may not have just one device. You might have several servers or several mm. destination devices where you need to stream. So this is how they keep all this um, environment working so mm. they can communicate to each other. But yeah, so this has been the eight things that a lot of people either get wrong or don't know about Plex Media Server and network attached storage. I hope you found this video. It's overrun, I think about five minutes longer than I would have liked, but we just wanted to make sure we covered all the bases. I'm sorry if you knew some of them and you waited till the end for some massive revelation that wasn't there. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope some of you found this very, very helpful. If you think there's tips that we've missed or certain elements about uh, owning a NAS for Plex Media Server that we didn't cover, maybe there's another video's worth in this. Maybe there's things that we've not covered that we just didn't know because we can't see the wood for the trees. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed the video, click like. If you do want to learn more, click subscribe. And if you are interested in finding the right solution for you, then do contact me and Eddie in the free advice section of NAS Compares. It's a link in the description. It's completely free. It's unbiased. It's only manned by me and that guy there. We just want to help people get the right solution. Again, tell us what you need. Tell we, where your expectations are. We can make a few recommendations. And then after that, the ball is in your court. Thank you so much for watching. Eddie, I will see you later. Cheerio. See ya. The rest of you, see you on the next video.